Welcome back to Quick Bits. What a stunning week last week was. I thought we'd be in trial with the state versus Alec Baldwin for at least another week and maybe a little bit beyond that because the pacing of the trial since opening statements Wednesday had gone quite slowly. But then the case on day three came to a staggering end when the court dismissed the case with prejudice. We're going to talk about that. There's more going on in the Karen Reed case. We're going to talk about that briefly. But today is mostly going to be about Baldwin and I think we're going to see more coming forward about this in the week to come. So let's get into it. I'm legal analyst Emily D. Baker. This is The Quick Bits, where I break down just the main points of the pop culture and entertainment cases I'm currently covering on YouTube and The Emily Show podcast. Let's get into it. First, real quick, the Commonwealth did respond in the Karen Reed case to the defense stating that numerous jurors had come forward to say that they had in fact reached verdicts on counts one and three. Count one is the second degree homicide and count three is the leaving the scene of an accident causing death. The jurors who have come forward to Alan Jackson and the friends of a friend of a juror who have come forward to David Yannetti all say they came to unanimous agreement on counts one and three. However, they did not memorialize those onto the jury forms. And under the law, it seems that there is not much the court can do to reopen this issue. And that's what the prosecution responded with. We're going to break down the additional motions that we haven't covered because I was in trial with Baldwin in the coming week. So make sure you have the Lawner app to know when I'm breaking all that down. But this is a legally very difficult position for the defense because reopening the jury after they've been dismissed isn't something that can be done. There's no law to allow for that. Once the jury is dismissed, it's over. And there's no law that allows the court to ask about what took place in deliberations. There are small exceptions to that dealing with outside influence. Did Courthouse Becky talk to the jurors? That is outside influence, but that's not talking about the deliberations. So as I said, when this came down, the law doesn't really allow for this to be remedied if this is what the jury decided. So we're going to have to see how this goes forward. And it might be that the right result is the prosecution chooses not to move forward on those counts. But I don't know if this prosecution's inclined to do that based on everything we've seen. But then again, my thoughts on this trial, especially after watching all the evidence play out, is why did they bring this case in the first place? So we're going to continue following the aftermath of the Karen Reed case and what's going to happen with any potential retrial. There is a hearing on July 22nd, so stay tuned for that. Let's talk about someone who's not going to have any more criminal court hearings, Alec Baldwin. Friday, July 12th, 2024 was one of the most unexpected and dramatic days of court I have ever witnessed, either personally in my own cases, in cases that my friends and colleagues have tried, or in any of the cases I have watched. I have never seen anything unravel so fast as the Alec Baldwin trial based on what came out. I'm going to summarize that. You can go back and watch it. There are large gaps on the day Friday where court was on break. And of course, on YouTube, we timestamped all of that so you can go back and take a look for yourself at what happened and the parts that are most relevant to you. On day two of trial, the crime scene technician was testifying. Mostly, it seems to lay foundation for what was recovered from the set, what was recovered in the search from Seth Kinney's PDQ Armor and Prop, the supplier for weapons and all of the prop rounds that were on the set at Rust. And in cross-examination, the defense started asking about other rounds that were delivered to Santa Fe sheriffs or told to Santa Fe sheriffs. And at the end of the testimony, the crime scene tech said, yes, this other individual, Teske, came and delivered rounds of ammunition to the sheriff's department and said these did not come from the set of rust, but may have had the same origin as those live rounds that ended up on the set of rust. And the crime scene tech testified to the jury unequivocally that what was turned over to her did not in any way match the live rounds recovered from the set of Rust. Remember, there were seven other live rounds that were taken off that set that matched 
in their casing, in their primer pin, in where they came from, and then in the shape of the projectile. So it was a very clear statement. No, nothing this individual dropped off to Santa Fe Sheriff's on March 6, 2024, the day of closing arguments and verdict in the Hannah Gutierrez case. None of the things that person dropped off matched what came off the set. And the defense made it clear that they had never seen that and asked if that was still available. And she said, yes, it's still available at Santa Fe Sheriff's, but it's under a different case number. But there's a supplemental report. When she kept saying there was a supplemental report, I was curious if there was a supplemental report that took those things being checked under a new case number and tied it to the Rust case. Because sometimes things will be checked under a new case number, and then there will be a supplemental report bridging the gap. And I was wondering if that's what had happened. No, it's not. No, it's not what had happened. And that became clear during a full day of evidentiary hearing on Friday. On Friday, it started with an evidentiary hearing where the court seemed surprised that the prosecution wasn't writing a written response. And the prosecution was like, I'll just respond in court. It's not a big deal. And as the day went on, it was clear that not only was the prosecution going full steam ahead, despite warnings that there was a massive iceberg, but that they were ultimately going to sink their own case. Yes, I've made Titanic references about this case since the beginning. The hearing started on Friday about 45 minutes before the jury was scheduled to come back. And as the hearing went on, it became clear to the judge that the jury was going to need to be excused for the day, and they were. The entire day was taken up with evidentiary hearing, and at the end of the day, the judge ruled that the prosecution had violated their Brady obligation, which requires them to turn over evidence to the defense. And the only proper sanction for that Brady violation was to dismiss the case with prejudice based on the fact that the defense did not have that evidence disclosed, that jeopardy had already attached to the case, and that there was no way to right the wrong that had been done by law enforcement and the prosecution. That ruling makes no finding of Baldwin's guilt or innocence. It makes no claim about his actions on the set of rust. It is a sanction for the prosecution and law enforcement failure to disclose evidence they were obligated to disclose. When we got through the winding story, what seems to have happened is that this individual, Teske, who is friends with Thel Reed, Hannah Gutierrez's father, believed that he had some rounds from Thel Reed from the set of 1883 that could have matched the mixed rounds that ended up on the set of Rust, which means those rounds probably would have come from Thel Reed to Hannah. And the prosecutor said as much when she took the stand, yes, I said that properly, don't worry, we'll get there. It was the prosecution's belief that those rounds had always stayed with Teske in Arizona and never came onto the set of Rust and therefore weren't relevant. However, the defense argued that these go to impeachment of the witnesses, that police had them, and they never looked to see how these rounds could have gotten on set. And it could have also gone to their defenses, that law enforcement just zeroed in on Baldwin and didn't check other avenues and weren't looking to see if this set was sabotaged in some way. And these rounds were brought on purposefully. Why does that matter? Well, at the end of this trial, we would have seen the defense arguing very much that there was an intervening cause here that stopped Baldwin from being held responsible. There's a jury instruction to it. Hannah's attorney tried to argue that it was the actions of first responders that intervened and caused the death of Helena Hutchins. But if somebody had willfully brought rounds on the set, would that go a step farther than should Baldwin have known that this was dangerous, that having a weapon on set was dangerous? So there were ways the defense could use this information to either impeach law enforcement or potentially to argue intervening cause, even though those rounds clearly didn't come from the set of rust. The problem with the rounds is that law enforcement didn't disclose it to the defense. The prosecution didn't disclose it to the defense and they put it under a separate case number. When lead investigator took the stand under the questioning of the judge, she said the decision was made to put it under a different case number with her, the crime scene technician, her supervisors, and prosecutor Morrissey. And that is the moment when you could see the judge sit back in her chair and go, mm-hmm. That is the moment when the judge was done. 
And we learned as the hearing went on that there had been another Brady violation in this case. And we had heard about reports that hadn't gotten turned over. The court had limited testimony of a gun expert because their subsequent reports weren't turned over. And it seemed that those subsequent reports weren't turned over to Hannah Gutierrez either. And that is something I think we'll see more about this coming week. And I will break down more in the longer podcast this week because I imagine defense attorney Bowles will be filing a motion Monday. He keeps telling media outlets he's going to do that. After the lunch break on the hearing Friday, Erlinda Johnson, the special prosecutor who I liked so much in opening statement, I thought her demeanor was great. Her questioning was great. I was really looking forward to seeing her more in trial. I very much liked her style of questioning and very much liked her opening statement. Erlinda Johnson approached the bench and we didn't know what it was about till later in the day. Well, later in the day when Carrie Morrissey took the stand, yes, took the stand to testify and seemingly clear her name about your honor. We didn't do this maliciously. I didn't know it was under another case number. Law enforcement didn't tell me they were putting it under another case number. I told them to document it and I thought that it was connected to this case. I didn't know there's a terabyte of data in this case and I had no idea. It doesn't really matter though because if law enforcement knows then the DA knows that is how the law works. So the DA can't just feign ignorance and say, oh, I didn't know law enforcement buried it. The obligation extends to the knowledge of the police department is the knowledge of the prosecutor, even if they don't have actual knowledge. But on cross-examination, because yes, she was cross-examined by attorney Spiro, who to his credit did not become overexcited. The way he was able to stay calm and composed and collected during that cross-examination is something I was very complimentary of because this is a wild moment in court where you are cross-examining the prosecutor. They have been going back and forth after each other in motions for months, and he is then cross-examining her in court. But he asked about all the people who had left the case since she came on, including Erlinda Johnson, who he asked, did Erlinda Johnson quit this case today? And that is what they had approached about at lunch. Erlinda walked off the case after the lunch break. Carrie Morrissey said on the stand under oath, and because she's a lawyer, she also owes a duty of candor to the court, but was also under oath that Erlinda didn't agree with the hearing being public. Well, Erlinda isn't going to suffer any of Carrie Morrissey's shit at this point and did multiple media interviews where she was very clear that when it came forward that this evidence had been buried, her suggestion to the prosecution team was that the case had to be dismissed by prosecutors. And I agree with her. That is the right thing to do. If you are aware of this kind of Brady violation, the right thing to do as a prosecutor is to dismiss the case then and there. Jeopardy already attached. There's no other way to fix it. And when that suggestion was not heeded by Carrie Morrissey, she left the case, which I think also probably signaled to the court that this was a huge issue in the eyes of the other prosecutor. So I have deep concerns about that statement by Carrie Morrissey under oath, and I think we will see that come up in the future. The court at the end made a very thorough ruling, going through all the elements of finding the Brady violation, and at the end said bad faith is not required, but this is as close to bad faith as it gets. So the court was very strong in her language of indictment against the prosecution and law enforcement. The judge was outraged by this. You could see it on her face. And as the judge was making it clear that this case was being dismissed with prejudice, it cannot be tried again. The actions on the set of Russ cannot be tried again against Alec Baldwin. He broke down in tears in the court. And you could see how relieved he was. And I'm not surprised because on Thursday, his legal team suffered a massive loss in court when they said to the judge, Your Honor, we believed you were keeping out Baldwin's statements about what he knew about the danger of guns on set, a key issue in this case. And the court said, then you should have paid closer attention to my ruling. And his team was pale sitting in court because they thought those statements would come out. Those statements are incredibly powerful evidence against Baldwin showing that he knew and should have known that weapons on set were dangerous. And that was really one of the critical factors in this case. So the case on Thursday was going very well for prosecutors. 
to turn around and have that case absolutely dismissed on Friday is wild. Alec Baldwin's legal team was tireless in trying to discover what prosecutors had done or had not disclosed. One of the questions I got a ton in the chat and will continue to get is, what does all this mean for Hannah Gutierrez? Well, her attorney Bowles has said he is immediately making a motion on Monday to have her case dismissed and have her released from the 18 months of custody she's been sentenced to. I don't think that will be successful. But the things to keep in mind as we look at that motion are, Teske, the witness that went to law enforcement and gave them those rounds, was a defense witness for Hannah Gutierrez. And they chose not to call him because those rounds make it more clear that the mixed rounds came from Thel Reed and from Thel Reed to Hannah and then went on set with Hannah. The bigger question for me will be the reports from the gun expert that seemed to not be disclosed based on testimony in the hearing Friday. Expert reports that Hannah's team did not have during trial. That is the bigger problem here, not the Teske rounds. But the standard is different that Hannah's team has to meet. The standard after trial is that the jury result would have been different, a much different standard and much harder standard than what Baldwin was facing mid-trial. The court as to Baldwin needed to find that this was material, not that the result would be different. To Hannah, the finding must be that the jury result would be different because of this information. So while I'm interested to see Bowles' motion and the motion practice that is going to go forward with this, presumably with Carrie Morrissey, it will be interesting to see how it's handled, but the question in Hannah's case was not as much about the guns working order and the weapons experts talking about the guns working order. It was, did she load those rounds into the weapon and did she fail to check them? So I don't know if the court will ultimately find that the jury result would be different because this information doesn't go to whether or not Hannah loaded those rounds, which in police interviews she said that she did. So it is a much different circumstance. But like the Reed case, I don't think we are done seeing what comes out of everything that happened in court on Friday. But as to Baldwin, all criminal liability is done. It does not impact the civil cases. Those can still go forward. And this really won't come up in the civil cases because it makes no finding, ruling, or statement about Baldwin's own culpability. Everything that happened in court Friday goes directly to the behavior of law enforcement and the prosecutor. Their behavior is what was sanctioned in court. And there really wasn't any other sanction based on everything that came forward. The other question I got was, well, didn't Baldwin's attorneys know about this? Well, they knew about it enough to ask, and I suspect they knew about it enough to ask because they have a mutual defense agreement with Bowles. And Bowles knew of the Teske witness, and I imagine Bowles would have known that Teske went and dropped these things off at Santa Fe Sheriff's because they seemed to have a good working relationship and it's his client's father's bestie. So I think Bowles would have known exactly what Teske did and would have told Baldwin's attorneys that. So Baldwin's attorneys only would have known that something was buried because they knew what to ask for because of Bowles. But them knowing what to ask for doesn't change the prosecution's responsibility to turn that over. The prosecution is who messed up here. Law enforcement is who messed up here. And this is going to have repercussions for not only the crime scene technician, but for the lead investigator in this case, Hancock. When Carrie Morrissey testified, she said that the crime scene technician's statement under oath that none of the rounds that were brought to Santa Fe Sheriff's and the rounds on Rust matched was untrue. And that is going to have implications for that crime scene technician going forward. And the Brady findings going to have implications for I.O. Hancock going forward. But for Carrie Morrissey, it's not like the prosecutor's office can demote her or reprimand her. She's a special prosecutor. They hired her to handle these cases. But those statements under oath to the court about Erlinda Johnson, and if there are others that seem to not be accurate, those could have impact for Carrie Morrissey. <sighs> I know it's a lot, and we're going to keep talking about it this week. So again, make sure you have the Law and Her Dap. 
You know that day in court on Friday was making both the prosecution and the defense sweat more than just a little bit. But if they were using today's sponsor, Lumi, then at least they didn't have to worry about being stinky. You can use it everywhere from your pits to your feet and everything in between. So no matter how hot it gets outside or in the courtroom, you can still smell fresh and feel confident. Lumi is baking soda and paraben free and pH balanced and comes in a wide variety of incredible scents including toasted coconut, which really does smell just like summer at the beach. As a special offer for our listeners, new customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code. And if you combine that 15% with the already discounted starter pack, that equals over 40% off the starter pack. And if you get that starter pack, don't forget to check out my favorites, the deodorant wipes and the body wash. Use code EDBQB, like EDB quick bits, for 15% off your first purchase at lumideodorant.com. That's code EDB. QB at L U M E D E O D O R A N T dot com. Let's get back to the quick bits. And with that, thank you for being a law nerd and thank you for being here for the quick bits. For deep dives into the stories that I covered here, you can find them on my YouTube channel at The Emily D. Baker and The Emily Show Podcast. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday. The podcast goes live on Wednesdays. And if you want to stay in the loop with everything I'm doing, receive the fastest notifications out there and get more Law Nerd community, join me at lawnerdapp.com, our free app for iOS and Android. 